Our last and final speaker today is Devin West. He's a fourth year medical student visiting us from St. Louis University School of Medicine. And he's gonna be talking about CPEO. Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Devin West. As he said, I'm from St. Louis University. And uh, I spent the first two weeks here at the Moran. This is my third week. Um, so I, I spent the first two weeks in neuro-ophthalmology clinic. And so today I have uh, a case to present to you. So I will first present the case, uh, talk about the diagnosis, and then thirdly talk about just kind of the take home points for us to um, have in practice. So the patient it was a 57-year-old Caucasian female without a chief complaint. She was referred to us by her neurologist. And her story started in May of last year. She went to her optometrist for complaints of blurry vision. It was her routine checkup. And her optometrist noted some bilateral uh, limitation of e extraocular movements and referred her to an ophthalmologist. The ophthalmologist confirmed that she had cataracts, uh, visually significant in both eyes, and confirmed that she did indeed have some extraocular limitations in all directions, both eyes, and also had some bilateral ptosis with the right eye being greater than the left eye, which per her history was present for many, many years. And so this ophthalmologist then, um, prior to taking any action with the cataracts, referred her to a neurologist for a workup. Now speaking with her, her past medical history is significant for uh, diabetes type 2. Her last A1C was 9.7 in December of last year. Asbestosis, um, an ab abnormal thyroid, which um, had been detected several years prior and she had had an ultrasound and it was term determined to be normal and uh, just kind of benign multinodular type picture. Um, depression. And following the workup, she did, did have cataract extraction bilaterally in April and June of this year, which resolved the blurry vision. And her surgical history is there as well, some C-sections, uh, cholecystectomy, and tonsils and adenoids. So her family history, she has no family history of any muscle issues, no progressive weakness, uh, no history of myasthenia or any autoimmunity. Specifically, we asked about thyroid disease. Um, she does have a fairly strong hi family history of Alzheimer's disease in both her parents and several aunts and uncles. Uh, coronary artery disease and coincidentally she has an aunt who is a non-blood relative that has uh, MRF. And her daughter, when she pres came to clinic to see us, her daughter was there with her. And her daughter said that she, f from time to time, has diplopia, has some double, vis double vision and um, has been told before that her movements are not completely normal. So I mentioned she was referred first to her neurologist, and this was the workup that he had done. He did uh, first some blood work. He obviously checked her thyroid, which was normal. She was negative for any anti-acetylcholinesterase or acetylcholine receptor antibodies. But she did interestingly have an elevated lactate and pyruvate. MRI was normal, uh, bilateral carotid ultrasound was normal, um, swallow study was normal, and he also did send her for some genetic tests, um, ANT1, OPA1, PLLG, Twinkle, and Milas, which were all negative, and then referred her to us for confirmation of the diagnosis, um, which of course was CPEO, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. So on exam, this is what we found, fairly normal except for stereo. We noted that she was, um, she had limitation or, or poor stereo vision. And facial, in terms of cranial nerves, she was normal except for a few noted um, weaknesses that, uh, that are here. Bilateral orbicularis oculi weakness and an incomplete blink in the right. And we'll look at the doll's eyes movements in a second. 
Uh, her thyroid was non-palpable, and on slit lamp and, and fundus exam, it was unremarkable, except for some peripapillary pigment changes. So I'm going to play this video. This is uh, Dr. Degree um, doing her extraocular movement exam, and there's audio. Can you uh, follow my finger with just your eyes? You can see that she has limitation of gaze to the right and to the left and up. And her down gaze is slightly better, but it's still limited in her down gaze. I'm going to check her saccades. Look at my thumb, finger, over here. Or, or over here, can you look over that? There you go. Thumb. Finger, thumb, finger, thumb, and they're slow. Thumb down here, finger, thumb, finger, and slow there as well. Now close your eyes as tightly as you can, tight, 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 and I can easily overcome it. And as you can see, she has tighter, she has very little Bell's phenomena. Her eyes don't roll up when I have her close her eyes really, really tight. Yet she has really good facial musculature. Keep your mouth closed now as I try to open it. Very good uh, strength on her mouth closure. Can you focus on your finger here? And I'm going to turn your head, and I just want you to, let's get it up a little bit higher. Um, just try to keep focusing, focus, 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 focus. And maybe she can overcome it a little bit. Now I'm going to have your head go down, 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 down but not very much. She can get down further, keep looking down, but we're not able to really overcome that up gaze paresis. Okay, so um, very typical findings of CPEO, which we'll go over in a, in a minute. And so chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, first described in as early as 1856 by Dr. Von Graff, um, who was instrumental in glaucoma and also pictured there designed uh, the von Graff knife, which I believe was used uh, for cataract surgery um, for several years in the past. So the main symptoms for CPEO are progressive bilateral um, limitation of vision with progressive ptosis. And one study showed that the most common symptoms were difficulty with small print and difficulty with driving, so almost a um, a, a convergence, divergence, insufficiency type of picture. Uh, but most patients are asymptomatic and often do not complain of diplopia. You look at their movements and you think, wow, this person should have diplopia. And actually, I didn't show up, but on exam, she also had a, about a, a 12 exophoria, which um, was similar in lateral gazes. But again, she did not have any diplopia. So etiology for CPEO, it's not specific for any single disease. However, it is the most frequent manifestation of mitochondrial myopathies, uh, hence the genetic workup that the neurologist performed initially. Now the history of etiology, initially it was just sort of thought to be a, neuro a neurologic process, and then an early biopsy showed uh, myopathy, and so then people said, okay, well, it's myopathic. But then uh, brain biopsies from patients with CPEO showed some spongiform changes. So then it kind of swung back to the neuropathic side. Um, and it wasn't until Olson and others in 1972 did biopsies that showed the prominent ragged red fibers that we know from mitochondrial myopathies. And um, the consensus today is that it is uh, a myopathic disorder. However, it is multi-system and may involve uh, the nerves as well. And interestingly, there is no genotype or phenotype correlation. Um, there may be, people may have CPO with none of the known genetic defects, and specific defects are not associated with any worse prognosis. So I, there's a list there at the bottom of some of the other differential diagnosis considerations when you find CPO. Uh, but again, the number one or most frequent, it, it is the most frequent manifestation of mitochondrial disease. And so that's what we should think of first. Now, most important with CPO are the associations, um, which are listed there. Most we can observe on exam. Um, a couple require that we take more action to get more objective data. 
That would be pigmentary retinopathy and the cardiac conduction abnormalities. So in terms of the evaluation, again, we've sort of already touched on all these blood work to rule out myasthenia and thyroid. Muscle biopsy, which show, can show in the top right there, the ragged red fibers um, on Gamori trichrome staining. And uh, ECG, which is kind of the most important. These patients are prone to heart block, uh, syncope, and sudden cardiac death. And so uh, with when CPO is found on exam, that is one of the most important, if not the most important thing that we do. Uh, fundus exam, ERG, MRI to rule out any mass or cerebellar involvement. Um, oculopharyngeal dystrophy is on the differential, and so that would be the reason for a swallow study. And plus or minus tensilon test uh, for myasthenia. However, the tensilon test, as you know, increases the acetylcholine, which can slow the heart. And in these patients that are susceptible to heart issues can be a dangerous thing. And then, as always, the genetic assays. Treatment, there's not too much treatment. We can divide it between mechanical and medical. You can use, as pictured above, the uh, ptosis crutches added to glasses or tape to help the lids stay open. Uh, strabismus surgery is um, sometimes performed, but with a little bit of hesitancy because these patients obviously are myopathic and the muscles do not um, react to surgery or adapt from surgery as normal muscles do. And then some medical treatment. One study showed that coenzyme Q supplementation uh, improved neurologic function and decreased the lab values of lactate and pyruvate but did not improve the CPEO or the ptosis. So, um, and others, other supplements are sort of anecdotal. So back to our patient, she, we did a full field ERG, which was normal. We recommended that she have an annual EKG. Um, we did a Humphrey visual field, which was also normal. And we, her daughter, you know, reported some of the similar symptoms that I mentioned in the family history. And so we counseled uh, her daughter has never seek, sought a workup for this, and so we um, thought that she might be interested in that in the future. Um, but these are the kind of the take home points. It's progressive extraocular muscle restriction or limitation with weakness and ptosis. It's the most frequent manifestation of mitochondrial disease. No proven treatment exists, however, some anecdotal evidence is there for some supplements. And the serious complications include cardiac conduction defects, retinopathy, endocrine abnormalities, if you'll remember she was diabetic, and uh, dysphagia. So I want to thank the neuro team that I worked with for the first two weeks for their teaching and help with this case, and everyone else I've met. I've had a great experience thus far. Thank you. <laughs> Any comments, questions? Okay, thank you.